So where I start my talk is a brief little discussion about where I was, who I was, who Shelley Yates was. And I was a very unhappy little girl. My sexual abuse started at age five and it went on for a very, very long time. I was what I called a Prozac princess because I was either on Prozac or lithium or something trying to just stay on the planet. I was so unhappy, I was suicidal every day in my life. I would plan elaborate suicides and then say, oh, I can't do it today, I'll have to wait till tomorrow. So I'm very blessed that tomorrow never seemed to come and I never tried and I'm here to tell this story to you. And the biggest miracle I share with you tonight is that as individual human beings, we have choice to step out of our misery. We have choice to step out of despair and depression and walk into joy. And I've done that without any drugs. I'm now drug free. I've been drug free for five years. I was told I would never be. So that to me is my greatest joy and blessing that I get to share with you. But there's a whole bunch of miracles along the way. On November, November 14, 2002, my four-year-old son and I were going to a friend's house. Uh, I was going to a friend's house to go and complain about my life. That's what I was doing. And I did it three times a week. It was my buffer zone. So I had my son in the front seat with me and we were headed up an abandoned road in Nova Scotia. And as I went up this little abandoned road, I saw on the left hand side a large lake that had flooded. We had had rain for three full days. The lake had flooded. The water was rushing across the, lake, uh, the road into a small marshy pond. So I slowed down to 20 because I didn't want a hydroplane. And as I entered the little river running across the road, my tires lifted up and pulled towards the guardrail. And I went, oh shit, now I'm going to beat up my car. I was on welfare. I was in university trying to put myself through school with two small kids. I couldn't afford to repair the car. That's all I could think about. As I moved towards the guardrail, the guardrail was buried into the ground. And my passenger side tires went up on the guardrail. And I kind of roller coastered into the center of this lake. Now logic states I should have rolled over on my side or hooked up in the guardrail, which bummed me out even more because it was going to cost more money to get a tow truck. <laughs> but that's not what happened either. As I moved into the center of this little body of water, my car without any motivation flipped over the guardrail out into the lake 10 feet and landed on the roof. So I looked at my son and I said, are you okay? And he said, yes, mommy. I said, well, mommy's going to put down the window and we're going to crawl out. Because I thought I'd landed on a bog. I'm from Newfoundland. We know what bogs are. So I thought it was a marshy bog and I was very happy because it didn't crunch the roof of the car. So I put my finger on the window and as I did, the water started to rush into the car. The window only opened this far. And I realized that my bog was a flooded marsh and the car started to sink very, very quickly to the bottom. Now I wasn't panicked because I was a lifeguard and a scuba diver. I had my nationals. I had every, everything you could think of to do with lifeguarding and survival in water. So I looked at my son and I said, okay, this is a lake and we have got to get out of this lake. So when I tell you, you take a deep breath and mommy's going to open the door and we're going to swim out of the car. And he looked at me with that little boy, mommy can do anything, look. <laughs> So I grabbed him by his coat and I gripped tightly to hold his coat and I put my other hand on the door handle and I waited and as the water came up over me and it was cold and as it came up over and came up over I got to the point that we had to breathe and I said okay take a breath now baby and the two of us took our breath and the water came up over our heads very quickly. I pulled the door handle, the door wouldn't budge. I leaned over, I pulled his door handle, it wouldn't budge. I started a little frantic pulling on doors and pushing on windows, nothing was moving. I needed both of my hands. So I took my son's body and I lifted him out of his chair and I pushed him into the back seat over my head, hoping if there was anywhere in the car that there was air, it might be in the back. But when I looked back, that car was upside down and if there was air, it was in the trunk. So I pushed him away from me and I began in earnest life saving. I'm pushing on doors and I'm pushing buttons and I'm pulling on things and I put my feet against windows. Nothing's budging and I had to breathe. So as I took in my breath, the water rushed into my lungs like liquid fire and I lost my cool. My, my ability to life save went out the window because I didn't mind dying, but my baby was drinking in fire water too. 
and I went into pure panic because I knew I was going to die. I could not get out of this car and I knew I was going to die so I wanted my son's body back. I wanted him to hold him because in his dying moments I had pushed him away. What was he going to think? So I started frantically searching the car for a coat tail or a shoe or something I could grab and pull back so I could die with my baby in my arms. I couldn't find anything and the more frantic I got I had to breathe. And just before I took the next breath, I heard in my ear, as loud as my voice to you today, relax, relax. And it was booming and majestic and commanding. Well, I didn't take commands from anybody. <laughs> so this made no sense. I thought this was dying. I thought well, I was, you know, hallucinating. Relax. And then almost as if the voice knew who Shelley was, it stopped commanding me and it started to lull me. You're okay. You need to calm down. You're going to be okay. They're coming to help you. Well, I was on a kind of an abandoned road. There was not much road traffic there. And I said, nobody's coming to help me. But all this happened. I wasn't looking for my son. I wasn't worrying about breathing. A, a time seemed to stop. All of a sudden, in through my chest came the knowledge of drowning. If I continued to fight the water, my lungs would fill up with water. And if they filled up with water, the guy doing CPR couldn't bring me back. So you need to relax. You need to give yourself over to the water and allow yourself to pass. I didn't need much prompting. I was tired and cold. I was suicidal anyway. And I said, give yourself over to absolute pleasure. And I put my arms out and my head back and I died. That sentence is a sentence from the Rocky Horror Picture Show. <laughs> <laughs> Blows my mind, but that's what it was. So I died. My flesh and bones stayed in that car, but who Shelley is, the essence of who I am, went off out into the sky, and it was a majestic blue sky with little wisps of white cloud. And as I went up there, I found myself contained in a room, and the room was rectangular shaped with glass walls, but I couldn't see the glass walls. I just knew they were there. And if I was looking at the room this way, in the center of the room was a table, four feet by four feet by four inches with a large pedestal base. And down the left hand side of that table were three large beans in monk robes, heavy robes coming up over their heads, heavy big hooped arm holes that they were holding themselves like this. They had their head bowed. I knew the rules of the game. I knew what was happening. The first guy had taken a row, the second guy had taken a row, and now it was this third one on the corner. This long willowy hand came out of the robe and it looked like it had long fingers, but it looked like mercury in a tube. And it, and it picked up a die. Now when I looked down at the table, there was a relief map etched into the, into the table. And it was the continents before they split. And I learned, I learned that that was the Pangaea, but I could also see Lemuria and Atlantis. I was like, wow! So as this bean had the die in its hand, it tossed it across the table and the die rolled and it stopped and the bean was pissed off. I didn't, it didn't hear anything but you just knew the feeling of I didn't get what I wanted feeling. And out of the robe came the big long hand again and it went ping and my car flew over the guardrail and out into the lake because the Pangaea had shifted and it was me driving up the road. I could see Rocky Lake Road, I could see the trees and the little, the little lakes and I went oh my god he pinged me into the lake. No wonder I flew over 10 feet out into the lake when I was doing 20. He pinged me. So I'm like, oh my God, we're a petri dish. This was my feeling that humanity was a petri dish and these beings were sprinkling sand. Oh, look at them run. And I'm going, this sucks. But down the right hand side were three more beings. They were the same size, six or seven feet, no, seven or eight feet tall, large hooded cloaks, and the hood, their arms in these big um, sleeves. Now the ones on the left had been a gray color, and the ones on the white, on the right, were whitish, but not white white. And they told me, "Don't judge us. We're both essential. We are the balance of your existence." And then I understood this was all symbolic. Everything I was seeing was symbolic to teach me what was going on. So the three down the right hand side said. Twist of fate, twist of fate, twist of fate. Only on the corners are we allowed to intervene. It was a rule. So the three of them, without rolling the die or anything, went 
and they put stuff on the board. They said, we have put everything in place for you to save yourself and your son. Now is the time, child, to have faith. Well, I didn't have any faith. I didn't have any God. I didn't have anything. I used to say I had the power of one, all right, and you're looking at her. <laughs> I was one tough cookie. So these beings had put something on the table and said, we are going to give you the instructions to save yourself and your son. Follow the instructions implicitly and have faith, child. We are here. We love you. Ping, I was gone. I was coming back into my body. Now the whole time I was up in the sky, three things happened that saved my life. Remember they put three things down. Three things happened. There was a man driving north on that abandoned road and a man driving south. They were friends and business partners and they were on cell phones to each other at that moment. And as they drove by each other, the first guy said to the second guy, did you see that car in the lake? And the other guy said, it wasn't there when I drove by. So the three minutes that it took them to drive by, I went in the lake. They turned around and came back to the spot and jumped out of the car. Two of them said, I guess we're going swimming. And they said to the third guy, but you're not, because he was my second miracle. He was the second thing placed on the board. He was a nine-year veteran paramedic. And he was driving one of those cars. So the two guys went into the lake and they started going up and down trying to find is there somebody in the car. So they reached in the open window and they said yes there's somebody in the car, they could feel me. And they went around the car and around the car pulling door handles, they couldn't get anything open. Fifteen full minutes. Four minutes to get back to the site, fifteen full minutes to get that car door open. As a matter of fact the last time they came up they said we can't get anything open, we can't get her out. And at that point, the man said, I'm going to give it one more try. He went down, and his foot, I had a flat handle um, opener, his foot hooked, and as he lifted his knee, the door popped open. He went back down. He'd been in the water for 15 minutes. He said he was so cold, he couldn't squeeze his hands together. So he didn't know how he was going to pull me out. So what he did was put his hand in with open fingers and weave my hair back and forth, every bit of hair he could get. And then he said he was so tired he couldn't pull. So he threw his body back against himself this way. And after three or four big heaves against his own body, I popped out. He pushed me over to the man that was hanging from a tree and hanging out into the lake because I was 10 feet out. He grabs me. I rolled over. He said, your face was full of moss, your eyeballs, your ears. You were black and blue. And he was screaming to the paramedic. Get the dead chick out of my arms. This is gross, gross, gross. <laughs> I've, I've grown to know and love these men very deeply. <laughs> but he knew how gross this was. So he pushes me, the paramedic calls me over the guardrail and drops me. Starts CPR. Seven full minutes he pushed on my chest. Seven full minutes. 260 pound man. He looked over his shoulder and he said to the guys on the other side, she's gone. She's dead. And with that, I sat straight up in the middle of the road and said, get my baby out of the lake. <laughs> he rolled over backwards. There's a kid in the lake. And a bunch of people went back in the water because the other two people by now had hypothermia and they couldn't do anything. A crowd of people had gathered. They went in the lake. They started searching for my son's body, it, literally in the car, and they couldn't find his body. So anyway, they get out and they said, we can't find him, we can't find him. This woman by the side of the road is going, there's a man right there at the top of the hill because this was a quarry and there was a little tiny road, probably two lengths of this room. And she said, he's up at the top of the hill there with a boom truck. So somebody ran up and it took him 30 seconds to drive that boom truck down the hill because he was sitting in it having a coffee break. Third miracle of the day. Wow, boom, 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 three things. He comes down the hill. Two or three more people jump in that lake and they take the grappling hook, they hook it to the axle of the car and they pull the car up into the, up into the sky, 15 feet. And I can see my son's body floating in the back window. He's been in the lake for 30 minutes or more. They're saying, we've got him, he's fine. And I'm crying and screaming, he's not fine, he's dead. He's been in the lake for 30 minutes. I'm, I'm trying to get up and I'm pushing. It took four men to hold me down that day. You know the whole mother's love and so powerful? I had bruises from being held down. By that time the ambulance has, has showed up. They opened the car door and as the water flowed out of the car, my son's body 
floated out. And a man caught him. And they said, we've got him. He's fine. I knew he wasn't fine, but by now it was too late. And they were putting me in an ambulance. And they were taking me to the adult hospital, which was one other place. And they put him in an ambulance and took him to his hospital, which was somewhere else. So we went different directions. And the whole way I'm crying, give me morphine, give me morphine. I just want to be zoned out. I, want, I killed my son. I killed my son. I get to the hospital and it keeps going. I want drugs. I want drugs. I don't want to be here. And the doctors are saying, okay, and they're getting ready to give me a shot. But my boyfriend is there saying, no, 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 no drugs till we find out about Evan. And the doctor said, we've already found out about Evan. Your son is dead. And we can't lose you too. My blood pressure was 250 over 195. They had the crash cart ready. My core temperature was down to, you know, you shouldn't be here. And the doctor said, if you put your feet on the floor, you're going to have a heart attack and die, so don't move. My friends were all there crying and, and like, what are we going to do? And my other girlfriend, who's a real doer, gets in the car and drives to the other hospital and comes back and she says, get your ass out of that bed. Your son needs you. He's alive and he's over there. 